Hey gang, uh, so I thought I would share a tutorial on the TMAP package that we had talked about earlier in the semester. There's been several folks that are using this as a part of their class project um, and have run into some issues that I thought maybe a tutorial would help to solve. Um, so I'm back in the office for this tutorial and, and on this machine, I'm using R version um, 3.6.2, which is this uh, dark and stormy night. Some of you may be using um, 3.6.3, the newer version of R, but you shouldn't have any problems running um, this tutorial um, in, in either of those versions. Um, so the package that we'll be focusing on is TMAP or thematic maps in R. So you can need to install that on your computer and then you can just um, load that library. Um, there's a related package called TMAP tools that gives you a little bit more flexibility and control over um, some of the functions that are used in TMAP, so you'll need to install and load that library. Um, we're also using the simple features or SF package, um, so install and load that one. And then when you're plotting data, it's always good on a map to have some sort of um, background or base layer. And one of the things that you can use in, in TMAPs is this open street maps data. And there's a package that houses all of that for R. So this OSM data is another um, package that you'll want to uh, install and then load and then open street map plot r is another package that allows you to plot some of the imagery that comes from this open source uh, imagery of, of street maps so you can install and run that one and then tidyverse is the package that we have um, also talked about this semester but that's another um, package that's useful for uh, bringing in and summarizing data and cleaning it up um, so, so it's a pretty good number of packages that are involved with this tutorial, but otherwise it's a pretty straightforward example of how we can show spatial data, summarize those data, and explore patterns and relationships um, in both static maps or interactive maps. A good way of getting to know um, your own data. Um, so I shared with you um, a data set that um, was collected from White Creek on the campus of Texas A&M University. It's a fish community data set. I have that stored in this working directory here, so I'm just gonna set this working directory, but um, those data are available on um, eCampus. So to load data, we use, just use this function read underscore CSV, and then you can put quotations around the CSV file that you want to load. Of course, that file needs to be inside the uh, working directory that you just created. Um, so I'll go ahead and load that, and for others that are viewing this tutorial that may have their own spatial data, um, it, it's not really a complex data set. So I named that um, WC, which would stand for White Creek and then underscore fish. If I just click on that, we can explore what these data look like. It's a pretty um, simple data set. So the students that were working on this had 62 pools where they're pulling a seine, which is just a large net that we pull through the water to collect all of the fish that are there. For every seine haul, um, so pool ID is Seine Hall ID, then they would go to the next um, habitat that had deeper water with a calm surface. We call those pools in aquatic ecology. Uh, and at each of those locations, they would take an XY coordinate. And so these are just the same um, World Geogre uh, Geodetic System um, 1984 WGS 1984 coordinates that come off of most GPS units. Then we have a species code, and for us, we use the first three letters of the genus and the first three letters of the species, so gam af would be gam busia finis. And then we have a count for, uh, for that number of individuals for that species that were pulled from that um, pool, or that were collected in that pool. Uh, remember, one of the things we talked about early on in the semester was how to store data and how to enter data in, a, in an effective way. Um, in, in here, um, I have the data stored in long form. So um, we have pool ID, uh, XY coordinates for the second species, then a new species, and then new abundance. And, and that goes on um, all the way through 166 observations. So this may be how you store the data in raw form. And in this tutorial, I'll show you how we can transform that into a species by site matrix um, but we also need to have these X, Y um, coordinates in there. Okay, so I'm going to kind of close out of uh, um, WC underscore fish and talk about transforming the data. 
Um, so one of the nice things about tidyverse is this uh, are a couple of functions, one called gather and one called spread to go between wide form and long form. Um, and so we're going to create this object called fish underscore run. We're going to use the function spread. Uh, we're going to use that function on that um, data frame that I just created, wc underscore fish. Uh, here we give it a key, uh, meaning um, which of those columns um, do we want to spread so that the uh, values or the uh, vectors and or, or the values within the vector um, become column headings themselves. So we want to take all of those um, unique values or levels that were in the species column and turn those into um, their own columns. And then we want to populate each of the cells within that matrix with uh, data from the count column or the number of individuals that were collected from a pool. Uh, and, and so if I just click run on that, maybe this will give you a good idea of what that looks like. So I call that fish underscore run. We click on that. Notice we have pool ID here that goes one through 62. Uh, we have our XY data, but then we have um, the first species. Uh, we didn't catch any in the first pool or all the way through the fifth pool. We did catch one of those individuals um, in the sixth pool, and then it's NAs where we didn't collect them. A species like Cipronella lutrensis, the red shiner, is a very common and widespread species. We tended to catch at least one individual in most of the pools, but here's one in, in pool 14 where we didn't. Um, so what we have from this then is a species by um, site matrix, and we can go all the way across, and each of those species has their own column. And there was this one individual that we caught way down here in, uh, there it is, in this pool, um, in pool 47, that uh, the students weren't sure what that was, so they vouchered it and put a question mark by it. We later identified that um, fish, and so um, this voucher column actually we, we may want to remove before we analyze these data. Um, so um, that's what this next line of code does. So if this fish run two is just fish run, we're indexing on it. Remember inside, the in, inside these brackets, anything before the comma is a row, anything after the comma are columns. And notice we just have the negative meaning to subtract uh, and then the C for concatenate and we're gonna drop column 15, which was that voucher specimen. Um, so we can run that. Uh, the other thing that we need to solve quickly, if we look at this um, thing that I just created, that's fish underscore run two. Notice that Pimepheles vigilax or Pimvig is now the last column, and that vouchered individual has been removed. Uh, but each of these NAs in here actually represent zeros. So that could be uh, either the fish wasn't there, or it was there, but we didn't detect it. We're not thinking about detection at this point, just did we catch it? If so, how many? And if we didn't catch it, uh, we'll just enter a, a value of zero. So we need to replace all of these NAs with zeros. And that's what this next line of code is doing. So we're taking this object that we just created, fish underscore run two. Uh, we're putting uh, this, these square brackets so that we're multiplying that object times whatever is inside, this, inside of the brackets. When we're putting in there this function is.na, which will be a true or false, is the cell in the matrix an na? Uh, and we're using that same fish underscore run to uh, matrix. And then everywhere that we get um, a true uh, for na, we're gonna replace that with a zero. So this left arrow and then the zero just means that anytime that we have a, an na present, we're gonna replace it with the zero. And if it was a non-NA, in this case, a number representing the abundance of the fish species, then it will stay as that number. Um, and so if I run that and we click on this um, fish underscore run to notice now that the uh, NAs have been replaced by zeros. And what we have is a, is a nice matrix that um, either represents a zero for we did not catch any individuals of that species or the um, values there represent the number of individuals that were collected in that pool for that species. Um, and then the last thing that we might want to do is uh, calculate um, relative abundance. So if you watch the tutorial on the rare NM test package, relative abundance is where we take the total abundance, we divide the abundance of each species by that total abundance so we can think about um, how species abundances uh, vary when we take into account the total number of individuals that were collected. Uh, and so we might just want to create a column that, that is total that would serve as 
um, the denominator for a relative abundance calculation. Or maybe we would just want to think about where did we catch the largest number of individuals and that total column would be helpful for that as well. So here's fish run two, uh, dollar sign meaning we're going to go within that um, object and we're going to create in this case a new column that's um, called total with a capital T and we're going to populate that column with this function called row sums and notice the first S in sums is capitalized and we're going to summarize across um, fish run underscore two columns four through 14 so we're not going to sum the pool ID, we're not going to sum um, the XY coordinates, um, and we're not going to, um, uh, well, those three are being removed from that. Um, so that's the 4 through 14 part. So if we run that, notice over here that this changed from 60 um, observations with 14 variables to now 15 variables. And if I click on this thing one more time, and we go all the way to the end, we now have a column that is total that. Um, represents a summation of all of the specimens that were collected from the fourth column all the way over to the 14th column. Okay, so if we want to plot this in this uh, thematics map or tmaps package, um, the first thing that we need to do, and this is the part that might, might get you if you, um, if you forget to do this part, is to transform those um, data into a simple feature. And this is within the SF package. There's a function called st underscore as underscore SF. Um, so a standard feature to a simple feature. And here's uh, fishes2 is a new ob object that we're creating. We're using this function st as SF. And we're doing it on this fish underscore run2 that we just created. Uh, but notice here that you have to have those coordinates in there. And this is one of the questions I got from one of the students is, hey, I have my community matrix, but I don't have the coordinate data in that same matrix. Can I create a simple feature that I could then plot? And the answer is no. You have to have X, Y coordinates um, in that simple feature file um, so that when we plot it onto a map, we, um, each of the dots that represents a collection has a, a known coordinate to, to be assigned. Um, and so here, notice the argument is, is just chords equals, and then you do you can do C, and you want to give it the X coordinates and then the Y coordinates. I've got quotations around um, the column names X and Y. So if we just go back for a second to fish underscore run two, remember the um, longitude was an X and the latitude was a Y. So I'm just telling it um, the coordinate system where is the X and where is the Y. So we can run this and we have a new object that's called fishes2. Notice it's got um, 60 observations of 14 variables. So if we click on that, notice that at the very end here, we have this um, geometry that's been created and it's a uh, concatenate of the X and the Y. Um, but we still have information on pool ID and then each of the species that exists there. And this um, column is pretty critical for um, plotting in the TMAPS package. Uh, okay, so once you have that, your data are actually ready to plot. Um, in TMAP, there's a couple of modes that I'll show you today. There's a, a static mode where you create kind of the traditional map that would not be interactive. Um, and, the, and the other option is this view mode where you can create an interactive map where you can zoom in, you can click on the points, and um, you can actually do a lot more data exploration in this view mode. So we're going to start with the TMAP underscore mode is the function that we use there. And then in quotations, we're going to use um, the word view. Later, when we do the static version, it's, you just replace the word view with plot. Okay, uh, So we'll do tmap mode as view. And when I run that, notice tmap mode set to interactive viewing. It gives that down in the R console. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is rather than um, plot across uh, the entire world, we may want to just think about a, uh, a cropped map that's, that's focused on the area from which our fish collection came from. And the way that we do that in TMAPS is to create a bounding box or a B-box. So I'm going to create this object called my underscore B-box. I'm going to use the concatenate function. And notice all I'm doing is just creating an object called x min or the minimum value for the um, x coordinates. I'm using the min function on the vector of white creek underscore fish um, dollar sign x. So what's the minimum value for um, the longitudinal coordinate? 
Um, then notice it does Y min. So uh, instead of going on to X max, it, it does the two mins and then the two maxes. And that's pretty important. So Y min, uh, we create the same thing, but here we're, we're using the latitude. What's the minimum value of latitude? Uh, then we do the maximum value of longitude and the maximum value of um, latitude. And we create this object called my underscore B box. And if I just go down into the console and type in my underscore B box, and we have a look at that, notice that it has X min, Y min, X max, and Y max. And so what um, the um, TMAP package does is it uses these values to draw a box using those minimum and maximums that uh, represents a focus area uh, where we want to plot, plot our data. Um, so as I told you at the beginning, the other thing that you might want to do is um, plot this over some base map that has objects that give some context to the spatial dimensions of your um, data. And in our case, um, the students that were working on this project were interested in whether or not road crossings across the stream had an influence on fish uh, community structure within the stream. It's pretty widely documented that roads that have high out outflows or, or waterfalls basically um, can, can block fish movement and alter community composition. Um, so then we might want to plot our, our points, um, but how, how do they relate to um, roads in, in this case? So we can create this object called roads. We can use the function extract underscore OSM. So we're pulling information um, from the OpenStreetMaps um, data and then uh, underscore um, objects. So we're going to grab objects. Uh, so then you use key equals highway. We could also replace this with waterway if we were interested in where do those points fall along the stream. Uh, you certainly don't have to use only one layer at a time. We could create another one called streams and do key equals um, waterway. So I'll just show you roads for today. But um, there's a lot you can explore if you just do question mark extract underscore OSM underscore objects. Um, and then because we don't want to pull a bunch of data for, for the global open street maps, we use that bounding box that we just created to, to limit the spatial extent of the data that are downloaded. Um, and then we want that to be downloaded as um, a simple feature. So SF equals true in this case. Okay. So this will take just a minute. Um, so it says issue and query. Uh, it says that it's completed and then it converted that OSM data to the simple feature uh, format, which is the format that we want to plot in TMAPS. So now we have our fish data ready to go because we created this thing called fishes2 using the st as sf function. And we have um, some road data that we created using the extract underscore OSM underscore objects. Now it's um, time to plot and that's what this next line does. And the nice thing about TMAP is it uses the same grammar of the graphics that ggplot uses or the ggmaps uses. So we create, um, the first thing we do is we say, hey, we're, we're gonna use this tm underscore shape. We're just giving it um, an, an, the identity of a shape object that we wanna plot. In this case, we'll start with roads. And then the next thing is we just tell it what type of plot do we wanna use? Since roads can be approximated nicely as lines on a map, we use the tm underscore lines uh, and then within that, um, within that um, uh, function, we can use the um, argument color or col equals gray um, to show those as just gray roads. Then we can overlay on top of that, we, so we're doing um, TM shape again, this fishes two, um, where we use this um, projection equals lat long, remember, or long lat, I should say, uh, where we have longitude and, and latitude. And here you can use just the generic TM underscore symbols. I'll show you uh, in a moment how we could actually replace that with um, TM underscore bubbles to show circles on the map. And all of this um, can be found by exploring the documentation of the TMAP. If you're interested in what um, arguments you could use inside of each of these functions, you can do question mark TM underscore lines, for example. But let's just have a look at what this, this um, creates. Um, so notice here in the viewer in the lower um, right, we have this um, creation of a map that has um, this Esri World Gray Canvas as the backdrop. You could change that to OpenStreetMap. That's where we were pulling a lot of our data from. So that's what StreetMap looks like. Or you can do the Esri World Topo Map if you wanted to show it as a Topo Map. 
Um, so we can just stay as, this, as the great canvas for now, but the nice thing about this interactive map is you can scroll in and you can scroll out or you can zoom in or you can zoom out. Uh, this is Easterwood Airport just outside of College Station. This is mostly the um, campus of Texas A&M University. If we go back to um, open street map, you can, you can see Texas A&M University is, um, is labeled on there. Um, this stream, White Creek, starts on campus and it flows through campus. It goes under George Bush Drive. Uh, all of this is still owned by the university. This is the Poultry Science Center. This is the um, fire training center out here in the, um, this part here is the um, uh, wildlife range area. Uh, and then this is the wastewater treatment plant for the university down here. And then it eventually flows on to the Brazos River. But we can zoom in and, and think about these points. We can click on a point. It tells us our pool ID. It tells us the abundance of each of the species that are there. And, and this can be really useful for just kind of exploring the spatial dimensions um, of our data. Um, now, obviously, because we're thinking about community ecology and multiple species here, uh, it, it could be um, interesting to think about where do certain species exist across this landscape. Um, and so that's what this next bit of, um, of code does. And actually, I'm going to show you how to map two species at once. So we're still doing the same base code here. So tmap underscore um, shape roads, and we're still using those as gray lines. We're still using the fishes too with the projection. Um, but now notice I've changed it to tm underscore bubbles instead of tm underscore shapes. I'm downsizing the size of those bubbles. So size equals one would be equal to what they are by default. Size equals 0.25 would mean that those circles are going to be about 25% of what they would, uh, would have been um, uh, by, uh, under the default. And the reason for that is if you go back down here and zoom in, once we start getting close, notice that these circles are so large that it hides the, um, the, the exact location of those things along the stream. So we're going to reduce the size of the, of the uh, bubbles just using the size equals 0.25. And then we're gonna set the color equal to, instead of like the generic gray that we did with TM lines for roads, we're gonna do um, the color is equal to concatenate. And then I'm just putting the name of species columns, two of them in this case, Lepomus cyanellus, the green sunfish, and Lepomus macrochiris, the bluegill. Um, so the circles will be colored according to um, the, um, uh, uh, the species that uh, exist there. Um, and then this is this concept of the grammar of the graphics. We can do the, the plus sign and add more arguments to this. We can add in a compass, um, a north arrow in this case, and we can decide where we want to position that on the map. And we can decide what the text size is on that compass. We can insert a scale bar. We can tell it how many breaks we, we want it to have. Um, what, what does it start at zero uh, and, and go through, in this case, one um, kilometer, we can change the text size, and we can change the position of that. Um, and then we can lay out, uh, we can create using this TM underscore layout, where we want the legend to be, what, what we want the legend background color to be, and do we want to frame around that legend. So there's a lot of um, control using the grammar of the graphics over what this map looks like. Um, and because this is all just one line, you notice there's pluses at the end of each of these lines. Um, we can run this first line and then we'll all go through. Um, and we end up with um, this output that shows two interactive maps. The one on the left that has the um, hand and the arrow is for Lepsia, and the one on the right is for Lepomis macrochiris. And notice that um, when I hover over the right map, in this case, this red circle uh, appears on the left map to show me where approximately in space I am um, so that I can make direct comparisons between these two. And we can do the same thing. We can zoom in. We can think about, well, how does the distribution of these two species differ? Um, and specifically, are, are these um, roads that are going through here associated with any of the um, patterns in the distribution of these species? And, and the breakdown here is, interestingly, the um, let Mac is is only downstream of this 2818 crossing. For those that live in College Station, that may be meaningful to you. Um, and, and then we tend to see the uh, green sunfish lepsia upstream of that. Um, so this is a way of, of coloring the points here um, equal to the total number of individuals that were collected. So we have 
some information about how their abundance is redistributed across the riverscape. Um, so, so this can be really useful for um, exploring your data. Uh, the last thing that you that or the next thing that we may do then is think about well how can we simultaneously show all of the species across the riverscape at the same time because we may want to think about um, how a particular species uh, may may be responding to these longitudinal changes in, in connectivity um, and so that's called facet we can use facet mapping where we have a box for each of the species and then there's multiple boxes on there. Um, but one thing that, that's necessary before we do that is to just um, is to just change the um, the, um, the count column um, so that it's a log transformation. As I told you earlier, red shiner is a species that's pretty common. It also reaches really high abundances. So when you try to make comparisons like this um, using a heat map, um, if red shiner is really high abundance, then then you'll have one color for that really high abundance and then everything else is kind of washed out. You can address that by doing a log transformation. Um, and so here we're, we're just going to do the, um, within this WC underscore fish, we're going to create a new column called log underscore count and we're going to populate that with the log 10. Notice the number 10 is there representing the um, base function 10. Um, and we're going to use that count column, which is the number of species that were there. Um, and, and we're going to log transform the abundances of all of these species. Now, notice that I'm going all the way back to WC fish. That was the original um, data that, that we read in. Okay. So what that means is that I need to uh, transform it again to a simple feature. And that's what this fish is three represents. And notice you're still using the same coordinates arguments X and Y. So we can run that. Um, and then instead of transforming that in, into a species um, by site matrix, we can just plot that fish is three. So I'm going to do um, TMAP mode to plot so that we get a static map. Uh, and then I'm going to just plot roads and lines, uh, T shape, TM shape, um, fish is three now, and we're still going to do bubbles. Um, but now it's a log count, so we can think about the log transformed abundance of each of these species across the riverscape. And I'm going to reduce those uh, bubble sizes by half so that they don't cover up the uh, spatial information. Uh, TM facets is the argument that we use to um, create a different panel for each, in this case, species. So we use TM facets and then the by is equal to the species column. Um, and then free coordinates. Um, what that means, is, or free dot chords, what that allows to, to either happen if it's equal to true or not happen if it's equal to false is the resolution of each of those panels could differ. So if you have one species that exists among a bunch of sites and then one species that's just at one site, um, you may want to zoom in on just that one site. Uh, and so if you do free chords equals true, the uh, map of the species that exists at only one site would focus on that one site. What I want to do is show a comparison of the entire riverscape across all of these species. So I've set um, free dot chords, or do we allow the coordinates of each of those maps to differ um, equal to false, which means no. Uh, then you can do the compass and the scale bar, the same arguments that we used earlier. Uh, and so if we run this, um, it, it takes just a bit, um, and, and it creates this nice, um, multi-panel graphics. So I'm going to try and zoom in on this and make sure that that is the um, screen that I'm sharing. And notice now for each of the species, here's um, Ameris natalis, that's the um, yellow bullhead. It only occurred at three sites. Here's Red Shiner. There's a really high abundance down here near the fire training center. Um, here's um, a related species, Cyprinoma venusta, occurred at only one site. We only found one um, fungulus natatus way downstream. And so, it, you, know, we, you know, we can start to think about um, how, how the species are dist distributed and what the abundances look like um, across the entire riverscape, shown here as a single um, plot. Uh, so let's just go back to our studio. Uh, and that's the uh, extent of what I wanted to share with you on this, this kind of reminder or primer of TMAP, a way of creating these 
um, interactive um, map. So you can save this as um, an HTML file. You can do, uh, let's see, I think it's tmap uh, underscore save. Uh, we can, if we go back up and, and name this one with the two species, for example, two dot um, species, and I'll run that thing in tmap mates, uh, we can do uh, two dot species. And we can call it two dot species dot HTML. And let me make sure that's right. So I'm gonna do question mark, tmap underscore save. I'm gonna hit enter so that that comes up in the help description. Save tmap, save the tmap file. So, uh, so we start with what does what is the tmap object, and then what is the file name? And I'm pretty sure we have to put the file name in quotations. We can just scroll down to the end here, uh, where it gives an example. And so here is an example. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to run that line. Okay, and let's see. Oh yeah, that's right. So one of the problems, uh, or I should say limitations so far is that you can't save um, the what they call interactive small multiples. So because that was an interactive map um, with two species on there, uh, we can't yet, it's not yet uh, enabled to save that uh, as an HTML file. But what we can do is go back and, and save um, this first map, for example. Uh, we can call this map one. We can run that. And then we can change map one. And let's call it that. And it will create inside your working directory an HTML object. Um, that is based on that tmap object that you created. Um, so here it says interactive map was saved to, and it, you, and it tells me the directory to where it saved that. And then there's a warning message there that it's using this uh, long lat WGS 1984, which was not an issue for me because that was the um, that was the um, coordinate system that was used to collect those data. So let me see if I can share the screen on where, uh, oh, here we go. So I had that set to data and then there is, uh, let's see, data. Map, and what did I call that? I called that map.html. So there's that object right there that was created on 4.15 at 3.30. So you can, uh, if you click on that, it'll open it in your um, web browser. And let's see if I can share that screen with you. Here it is. Okay, so in, in, in the web browser, it shows the file path to that uh, location, but notice it's still that same interactive map that we had created earlier. Eventually, I think it'll be enabled where you can do this with multiple species, um, but you can create these interactive maps that you could then share the HTML file with, um, you know, colleagues or collaborators where they can where they can see the spatial context context of your data without having to have um, ArcMap, for example, that that is really platform. Um, so I'll just go back to sharing the R Studio screen and um, that's about all I have for you for this one. So hopefully that was a helpful refresher for TMAP if you had seen it before or a, or a primer for those that haven't used it before. And I just need to stop recording.